Hey, Post Road Jen, welcome to this new episode of Explicitly Pro Life Podcast. The pro life movement as a whole is striving every day to ensure that no woman in an unexpected pregnancy stands alone. On August 28th, church leaders around the U.S. are gathering to learn how to support pregnant women in their communities. And here's why. Since Roe v. Wade, women in our country have been lied to. Over 73% of Americans don't know where to find nonviolent pregnancy resources in their own communities, while abortion continues to be promoted and made easily accessible. As we step into a post-Roe America, Christians must be at the forefront of changing this reality and bringing life-affirming resources to pregnant women and their unborn babies. This is where churches can step in. More than half of abortion-seeking women identify as Christian or Catholic and often look to the church for help and guidance. Church leaders must be equipped to bring resources and empowering conversations to the pregnant, new moms, and their communities. Are you ready? Don't miss the nationwide event, Standing With Her Sunday on August 28th, and learn how you can support the most vulnerable in your community. So no woman stands alone. I'm your host, Kristen Hawkins, and today <laughs> we have in person uh, Jason Jones, not to be confused with Samantha Bee's no, husband. I'm still Jason. laughing at the joke I said before the cameras went It was in. bad. It was really bad. I it's laughing. explicitly pro-life. I don't know if we can get that explicit. <laughs> uh, but this is Jason Jones, the pro-lifer. So if you, when you go to Google and put his name in after this, uh, make sure you don't click on the Samantha Bee's I'm not crazy, Samantha Bee's husband. Yeah, crazy husband. This is Jason Jones, the pro-life activist pro-life filmmaker. You all probably have heard him at the Students for Life, Pro-Life Summit, yes. or we've done other podcasts before. We've before, done a lot right? of yeah. things together since I first met you since in 2006. 2006. That's it wasn't right. five. You always say it was 2006. And Jason told me I was going to hell because I wasn't Catholic. <laughs> and that was in the first 30 minutes of us working. We were in a car together yeah. driving somewhere in Missouri. No, we were walking out of a church. It sure. was a beautiful St. Louis church, and I could I sniffed you out. I thought this is one of those radical evangelicals that, that thinks Catholics are going to hell. So I'm going to beat her to the punch, and I said it, and you looked back at me and go, you said something like you're crazy, and just kept walking. Yeah. Anyway, and then when I converted to Catholicism, he tried to take credit for I me converting to Catholicism because he told me I was going to hell, <laughs> uh, but he actually was not involved at all in the decision. Sure, in fact, sure, sure. I probably stubbornly held on, held off longer. All right. So Jason, you are the executive producer of Bella, which was kind of the first big, I would say, like yes. mainstream pro life movie. We did a huge promotion movie. of it. Oh yeah, movie. Sorry. Um, Sing a Little Louder, which I love, which is a short film, mm -hmm. which I know a lot of our students for life groups have showed. Crescendo. On, yeah. Oh, Crescendo. Love it. We did a whole screening in um, uh, Phoenix on that. Oh. We did. Little Boy. Little Boy, Divided Hearts of America. Oh, and Divided My Hearts Culture. Of America, which is streaming now, right? On Fox it is. Nation. It's on Fox Nation. And you can get it on Amazon. And that was with NFL videos. champion Benjamin, Benjamin Watson. Watson. Yeah. Who... Part of the deal, we shot some of the film in my old neighborhood in Chicago. Part of the deal was he had to play catch with me on the lot where me and my friends used to play football. You totally wrote that, wrote that in just for yourself, right? <laughs> no, no, no. That was part of the deal of making the movie. Oh. If we make this movie together, you're going to play yeah. catch with me and the sand lot where I used to play football as a kid, and we did. Oh, life, life dream. I threw a pass to, to Benjamin Watson. What was more exciting, that or seeing Roe versus Wade being reversed? I mean, come on. <laughs> uh, Jason also writes for the stream. I do. Thank you. Um, yeah, I read all of your articles. You post them on social media. Do you? Most of them, yeah. Right on. Uh, he's also the author of The Race to Save Our Century. A, yeah. A book with lots of big words in it. So in my culture, it's very customary to give, it's our custom to give people gifts with the your name on Chicago, it. South Side Chicago, poor yeah, white people. When you meet yeah. people from the South Side of Chicago, it's very custom. Yeah, and they everybody They give you I something with their name on it. So this is a shirt with my name on it. It says the Jason Jones Show. 
It's another. And you podcast. know how much I love showing my arms. If you've ever seen a picture yeah. of me, you know I'm on arm show. Well, there you go. That's, that's why I got it for you. Thank you. This, Divi- is, this <laughs> is just my style. Yes. And Divided Hearts of America. <laughs> Divided Hearts of America, my latest film. Oh, love it. Thank you. And then um, The Race to Save Our Century. Thank you. And I'll autograph these for you. And I have the rice aroni. You're going to autograph but it's, for me? <laughs> yeah. Okay. But the rice aroni I left in my truck. Okay, thank you. Thank You're you welcome. so much. That's, this is great. It's like Wheel of Fortune. You know, I travel the country you and the fifth wheel, other... like more stuff is going to be awesome. You should have went behind curtain number two, but this was curtain number one. Okay, well, th- these are great. I've, a... I've read this and I've watched this. So well, I'm thank good. you. Yeah. I, but I'm not wearing that shirt. I'm sorry. I'm not <laughs> putting your logo on my chest to broadcast and have my arms. Ugh. Okay, so to, we've talked about your story in the past, how you got mm. to the pro-life movement. I know we've talked about... Um, I love, we did a podcast not long ago about like pro-life and abortion in movies, which I thought, you know, that's something that a lot of people always Mm -hmm. want to know. Like what movies can we watch to start the discussion, even with like a pro-choice friend? So I don't want to cover that today. Okay. I want to cover something. So when you spoke at, I think it was the Student Swap Conference in like 2007, I think it was during the Bella Mm -hmm. promotion period, you had used the phrase whole life. And my thought was like, oh, great. Here comes another liberal who's <laughs> going to come tell me that, you know, just abolishing abortion isn't that big of a deal. And we have to do a whole bunch more stuff um, and take away focus from abolishing abortion. So I want you yes. to, to explain to me and everybody watching and listening, okay. what does it mean to be whole life? And how does that not impede our mission of making abortion abolished in our country, unthinkable and unavailable? How does it help? Okay, well, first of all, when I first started using the phrase whole life, I knew that you thought I was, I'd was i lost my mind and started to like lack faith in me or trust mm-hmm. in me. Mm-hmm. Um, but your whole life, and everyone watching this is whole life. Um, mm-hmm. And what does whole life mean? When I was a young atheist pro-lifer, I entered the pro-life movement not knowing even there was a pro-life movement, not even knowing the words pro-life. As you know, my story, mm-hmm. I was, my high school girlfriend was forced to have an abortion while I was in basic training at 17. And mm-hmm. when I got to my duty station, I just started going door to door telling people that abortion was legal. What, right after your right child after. was aborted. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know that even the expression pro-life or right to life, I didn't know any of that. Quickly discovered that when I met the folks from Hawaii Right to Life. Because they did some random guy in the military was knocking on doors in Honolulu. Yeah, the woman from, I would give my number out at the desk uh, and my base and ask people if they wanted to help me knock on doors, call me. They gave my number to someone from Hawaii Right to Life who called me upset, thought, thinking that I was going around telling people I worked for them. I was that just- sounds about the pro-life movement. <laughs> yeah, it's true, it's true, that's what happened. And I said, wait, we have a group? <laughs> And Right to Life, that is such a clever name. And it sounds to this generation with Google and all of the resources that we have and this epic organization that is Students for Life of America, it might seem strange that a 17-year-old in 1989 did not know that abortion was legal, hadn't heard of Right to Life. I didn't. Mm -hmm. I had a book called Roe v. Wade in Focus from my post library that was published by the Alan Guttenmacher Institute, the research on Planned Parenthood. That was all I had. Um, but I was also really concerned about genocide and democide. I was a young infantryman. And you knew democide, you know that word at 17? No, I'll tell you how I learned the word democide. Look, let me tell you how lucky Just I am. Just keep it real. Look at, no, I'm about to keep it really real. I went to the University of Hawaii mm-hmm. when there was a professor there named R.J. Rummel, and he wrote a book called Death by Government. He coined mm-hmm. the term democide. And so I was greatly influenced by Professor Rummel and also another professor, Dr. Kate Joe, who is my thesis advisor. And she... Um, escaped China after the Cultural Revolution. And so through my friendship with her and through reading Death by Government, um, my my obsession was protecting the vulnerable from violence, Mm -hmm. from the child in the womb um, to children facing genocide and democide around the world. And in the 90s, when I was a student, it was in in Bosnia and Kosovo, it was in um, Rwanda, and um, the genocide in... What's democide, by the way? Democide is... is Genocide is when, obviously... that political communities target another community based on their ethnicity. Mm -hmm. Democide is just state-sponsored killing for power. Mm -hmm. So the one-child policy in China is a great example of democide because 
the one child policy became the principle of control that the CCP used mm -hmm. over its population at every level. And I didn't, and then I discovered with my pro-life student union at the University of Hawaii, and I, and I, I told myself, keep bringing it back to college because whole life and my whole mission of making movies and the work that we do around the world started as a college student. Mm -hmm. And as lonely and as impotent and as powerless as I felt as a 17 year old boy, when my, I lost my child to abortion, I felt the same powerlessness as a young student at the University of Hawaii with the faculty against you. Mm -hmm. In our state of Hawaii, the, the legislature was overwhelmingly against us. The governor was against us. Our delegation to mm -hmm. Washington was against us. And there was a sense of powerlessness. But I noticed that the students from the former Yugoslavia that were my classmates at the mm -hmm. University of Hawaii felt more powerless that uh, students from Rwanda or those students from China that were protesting the CCP were more powerless. And I thought, well, I have the student union, pro-life student union. I'm chairman of the college Republicans. Why don't I leverage my club to help them educate our campus on these issues? As powerless as I felt as a pro-lifer, I felt I had much more influence on campus. I had many more members to my organization and I had relationships with the state legislature. Uh, as, as small as they were. So when I got out of college, I had this idea to found an organization called the Campaign for Human Rights and Dignity, which I did. I founded it almost 20 years ago. We changed the name to Hero in 2004, but I didn't have an expression whole life. I didn't mm -hmm. have that. I just knew I wanted to order my life to protect the vulnerable from violence. Why I despised the consistent ethic as it was presented is they compared abortion to unlike and incommensurate issues. What should immigration policy be or what should And it... to back up to explain. So there's this seamless garment. They call it the consistent life mm -hmm. ethic. Yeah. And so they'll be, oh, yes, abortion is awful and terrible, mm -hmm. but so is not helping migrants at the border who... So is know, minimum wage being at $13, not yes. $16. Yeah, you know, we need $15 an hour. You oppose wage. midnight basketball programs. Therefore, you're not truly whole life, pro-life. Yeah, it's basically anything you want. Can and be it was a tactic. Yeah. And that tactic was designed to weaken the influence of pro-lifers in the Democrat Party. And this was yep. by design. Yep. Now, most of the folks that would call themselves consistent ethic mm -hmm. or seamless garment are sincere people mm -hmm. that hold to a left-wing, leftist ideology, and they believe what they're saying. But it was promulgated by people who are trying to weaken the influence of the, the movement to protect the child in the womb from violence. And mm -hmm. that was very clear to me. Well, I don't want to weaken the pro-life movement. I want to strengthen it. And I, I realize that if um, we, the issues that I care about are like and commensurate to abortion. Genocide is like and commensurate to abortion. Democide is like and commensurate to abortion. So I linked those and I wanted a new expression. And I didn't know what, we, we couldn't think of anything, but it was actually former... Um, governor of Kansas and former Senator Sam Brownback that actually accidentally coined it. In the 2007 primaries, I worked for Brownback as national grassroots he was director. Running, he was running in the Republican primary, primary for, for president. president. And Brownback coined the term. I'm going to tell you what happened. We had students following Mitt Romney around CPAC. And when he would go I on, know nothing about this at all. And when they would go on stage, nothing they would throw flip-flops like I have on my feet. Can I, am I allowed to talk about this? Yeah, you can talk about it. It just brings back some memories. Keep going. So we throw flip-flops on the stage. We've been causing trouble for such a long time. All right, keep going. So we throw flip-flops on stage, calling Mitt Romney a flip-flopper because mm -hmm. he's flip-flopped on abortion. Mm -hmm. Somebody was following him around in a dolphin suit. We don't know. <laughs> Who could it be? We don't know. Flip-flopper from Massachusetts. Uh, would it be strange if that young man that was following him around became one of the most influential figures and in organizations in America? That would be so strange. That would be so awkward. It would be yeah. weird. It certainly wouldn't anybody who runs a 501c3 organization that didn't have a 501c4 arm was never involved in any of this. Never. Never. So, never. So, um, okay. Flip-flops. So we were yelling at Brown, so these Brent about Romney. 50 students from Steubenville were following Romney around CPAC going, Brownback, pro-life his whole life, pro-life his whole life, pro-life his whole life. Brownback's been pro-life his whole life. Um, and so Sam, because he's such a gentle, kind soul, he's like, he's from Kansas. He has no guile. I don't know how he won becoming a U.S. Senator because he's no, like he the, no nicest guile, the nicest person, guy. like a normal Midwestern dad. 
Really? Yeah. yeah. If you travel with him, he causes kids to pray every day. And when I've worked around all my heroes and some of them, once the door shuts and you meet the real one, you're like, who is this sailor? You know, this pirate. And then, um, it's probably what people think of me. Yeah. Kristen Hawkins, that pirate. I didn't know she was in the Navy. Um, but, but Sam is more Sam behind closed door. It's just, he's Sam and he's Senator Brownback. And so he hears these students yelling pro-life his whole life. And Sam goes up on stage and he says, um, well, it's like my students are saying, I think that's so clever. I'm not only pro-life, I'm whole life. <laughs> and as soon as I heard that, I said, that's the expression we're going to use. So we did the pro-life, whole life tour for Brownback when he ran for mm -hmm. president. And then we launched it, I am whole life after that campaign. Mm -hmm. But it was a way for me to try to knit together my concern and how I wanted my apostle and my mm -hmm. organization. I, I, I'm addled by children suffering from violence, whether it's abortion, Mm -hmm. here or whether they're in a concentration camp in Chinese occupied East Turkestan. And that's why you not only a lot of people I think know you as founder of Moving to Movement, but you yeah. have a second organization, the Vulnerable People Project. They're both programs of heroes. Mm -hmm. So VPP, which used to be called I Am Whole Life. A lot of leftist groups liked Whole Life better than Consistent Ethic and started using it. Hmm. You might have noticed that. Yeah, I might have noticed that a little bit. Maybe and, that's why I I that. and they're using it kind of somewhere in between what Consistent Ethic meant and what Whole Life mm -hmm. is supposed to mean. So I'm, I'm happy with that. But I thought I don't want to confuse folks. So we just changed our name to the Vulnerable People Project. We're ordered as an organization, or as a program of HERO, the VPP is ordered at advocating and defending those communities that are truly, truly vulnerable, where mm -hmm. really no one else is willing to go and risk to serve. Yeah, because you've been working in Afghanistan for the past year. <clears throat> the I mean, last I, organization left. You're the last a terrorist NGO in Afghanistan, yeah. in, in Afghanistan yeah. still serving. And you've been in Ukraine. Yeah, I was in Ukraine recently. On my whole way here, I was on the phone um, sorting out problems in Ukraine. We're very committed to Ukraine. Mm -hmm. We have a truck that drives insulin all over Ukraine, a refrigerated truck. Mm -hmm. um, something you don't think about when societies collapse is how fragile something like insulin is. Oh, no, I think about it all the time. <laughs> yeah, so I didn't, you know. Yeah. And so, um, but yeah, that's, that's our mission. And I find just like in college how um, I was able to leverage the pro-life movement to advocate on behalf of community suffering genocide on my little campus. Mm -hmm. We've kind of, and this is why I want to share, this is why I'm excited to talk to you because these young people, um, now, I believe that I do a pretty good job. We do a good job of leveraging the pro-life movement, which is the loudest voice for the Uyghur in the world. It's the American pro-life movement. Mm -hmm. It's the movement. I had no idea who a Uyghur or what Uyghur was until I met. Now you have Uyghur friends. Yeah, now I have a Uyghur friend. A prime, prime minister. minister in exile. Yeah, that's right. So it's really... I'm super famous, by the way. She is super famous. Pro-life celebrity. Even beyond pro-life now, you're just a notorious celebrity. Um, and uh, you should get a neck tattoo. Yeah, notorious, right there. Right there, <laughs> I would do that. That would throw everyone off. But you know, that was so. What I did in college, I wanted to amplify influence for the child and the mm -hmm. woman, the vulnerable. And then what I noticed in college was all of a sudden the Serbian kids and the students from Rwanda and the Chinese students and the Hong Kong mm -hmm. students they became my partners in advocating for life. And I think you've noticed that that a lot of now Uyghur leaders and and I don't ask them to reciprocate, mm -hmm. but they do. They reciprocate and they lend mm -hmm. their voice. Um, for life. What we find is all these traditional communities around the world are pro-life. Mm -hmm. That it's neoliberal imperialism that is shoving the culture of death down the throats of these countries. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, we're knitting together, I think, at the Vulnerable People Project, uh, a beautiful team to serve the vulnerable around the world. Let me ask you a question then. So I'm pro I'm pro life, I'm whole life, you know, I just care, you know, I want people not to be killed. Um, so do you think pro-life student groups should change their mission statements to like focus on 10 issues or do you No, think... not at all. Say that again. No, no, not at all. Yes, I think they should all leave SFLA, go to thegreatcampaign.org and we're going to start whole life chapters. Not at all. No, that's the last thing I would want. Why? Why, Why? is that because the last Because they would dilute their effectiveness. They would dilute their effectiveness. For example, the last thing I would want is my teams that are running aid across yes. Ukraine to to take time out to hold an anti-abortion protest or something. Like they're, they have a very important job to do. Yeah. Um, okay, let me tell you, I'm so glad you asked this question. When I was on campus, how much yeah. time do we have? We have like 18 minutes, we're good. Okay. Yeah, when I was, 18 more When I was in college, there was this kid who wore different shirts every day. Like stop clubbing baby seals, 
literally he wore that shirt, like global warming shirts. The day he wore the Stop Clubbing Baby Seal shirt, I was late to class. I walked in. His name was Josh. And I said in front of the whole class, Josh, do you think there's ever been a student at the University of Hawaii who's ever clubbed a baby seal? Ever. In the 100 years of this campus? No, never. Why are you wearing that shirt? You're wearing that shirt to tell people you're a compassionate person. But you're doing no good for anything or anyone. Not a seal, not a anyone, but yourself. And I said in front of the whole class, I founded the Pro-Life Student Union. Standing for life on this campus is hard because some of our students are having abortions. It's an intimate thing for a lot of us. It takes courage. I said, Josh, when you're older and, they're, and you're in a position of influence and power, you will lack the courage to stand up even to defend the environment because you've never developed the skills of resisting your own community. And so when you are a pro-life student, standing for the child in the womb mm -hmm. with a, something that is very real to the lives of mm -hmm. your fellow students, and it's not an easy thing to do. In fact, I would say the hardest things I've ever done in my life is stand up for life on a university campus. I've made movies yeah. in Hollywood. I've been to Sudan to meet with the Janjaweed, Al-Qaeda in Sudan, I've been to Iraq with the battle against ISIS, documenting it. But the scariest, hardest, most nerve wracking thing I had to do as a young student at first, it becomes easy after time, mm -hmm. um, is stand up for life. Because I wasn't naive to the fact that this is a very personal decision to my classmates. It brings up something that was very sorrowful experience for many of them, and you don't want to open up old wounds. Um, but it takes real courage. And so when you stand for life on a college campus, what you can go on, you can go on to do. I saw a meme the other day that said, if you can watch a movie alone or eat dinner in a restaurant alone, you can do anything. I don't know if that's true, but if you can stand up for life on a university campus, you can go on to do anything. And this is why the pro-life movement, I've been trying to plant these whole life seeds because we will see very shortly, I think in the next 10 years, full legal protection for the child in the womb from seed to shining sea. But that is the first modest step into a culture of life. Mm -hmm. It's we just don't want our children to be born. We want them to be born into a humane, beautiful civilization. Mm -hmm. And so you're, this is why, and you know, I say this everywhere, even behind your back, mostly behind your back, that I believe Students for Life of America is the most important organization in the United States. Because oh, these students are going to go on to do oh, so many goodness. other beautiful, you're going to wear that tank top I'm now? I'm going to wear it now. They're going to go on to do the most beautiful things in the world that seem to have nothing related to abortion. You know, right now, we're, we're the only organization rescuing people in Afghanistan. It's mm -hmm. very challenging. I can't even, be, I'm going to cry. You know, because we're friends of all that we've had to go through over the past year. Yeah. All the human suffering that we've had to struggle in the midst of. And, and I've talked to my team, which is made up of like Afghans and former nuns. Like that's literally my team. And I'm like, why, how have we outlasted Navy SEALs and Green Berets and retired CIA officers with their little organizations? And how, how have we outlasted all of them and we've stayed? It's because we're pro-lifers. We're pro-lifers. We know about gritty resistance. We know about fortitude. We know things don't come easy. We know that you're trying to you're counsel your friend to choose life and she doesn't, and that's heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. And so all of these students, and there's so many. Like, I watched this one young girl you have on Instagram. She cracks, she's my favorite. Oh, what is her name? The one from uh, San Antonio? I don't know where she's from. Was it a clip of me on a campus? Holy girl with a Japanese last name, I think. Oh. Oh, sorry, I'm using Hawaiian Autumn. language. Can I, can I speak to Autumn from? Hagashi. Yes, Autumn, Autumn, Autumn. She's my favorite. What, what's Holly? What's, what, what Holly, I'm sorry. Holly is Hawaiian for white. Oh, yeah. He's also white, oh. but okay. I'm a Holly. Okay, okay. But my kids are Holly. Yes, Kenyans. Autumn, yes. Her, her husband's from Hawaii. Uh, so, do so. I know them? I don't know. It's a small island. Them. Maybe. I don't know. The they're the best. She's my look favorite. Look up the Hagashi. No it kind of seems like she's a common favorite. last name. She's my favorite Instagram. Yeah, she's really good. She's funny. Oh, I'm so well, awesome. I watch all these young people that are part of SFL, and I'm like, what, have I, what am I doing with my life anymore? Like, I don't even really need to do anything. I know. I, I hear Am speak, and I'm like, why did you have me come? Because she could just do a better job than I. Right? <laughs> but you can't tell them that, though. I know. I know. Isn't it great to be, I mean, I'm much older than you. But to look at a younger generation and go, wow, they're, they're more competent than us. Because, mm -hmm. you know, we're supposed to go, oh, these kids today, they don't know anything. Yeah. It's, a, it's actually, it's a very gratifying feeling to be able to go into, you know, the National Pro Life Summit or wherever and be like, I'm actually not needed. And they're so brave. I'm just like, 
I'm just like eye candy for some people. Like I don't even you know why. You put this I'm on here. and we're now. Yeah, we're... I'll be real eye candy with this song. That's why I gave it to you. The Jason Jones show. I feel bad. I'll have to wear it now. Okay, but... I'll get you. I can get you more shirts. No, but... but I think that I think that was a really powerful point that you just made, though, of the courage it takes to stand up to say mm-hmm. you're pro life, and once you've done that mm-hmm. and you've experienced how hard it is, one, it gets easier the more you do it, mm-hmm. but then you're going to be more likely, no matter where you end up in life, no matter you know what issue you dedicate your life. You know, to working towards what human rights issue you want to solve, you're going to always have that base. Yeah, look, the culture of death, the logic of Roe has worked its way into everything from our foster care system to our foreign policy. So all these young people that are students involved with SFLA, we're going to need to reform foster care. Mm -hmm. Our foreign policy has been a catastrophe. Uh, You look at Afghanistan, Yemen, Iraq, Syria, Libya, Mm -hmm. um, Ukraine. It's just been a catastrophe. And I really do believe that that... If there were no Roe v. Wade, we wouldn't have abandoned so thoughtlessly Afghanistan the way we did last year. It took a president Mm -hmm. thoughtless to the child in the womb that became thoughtless to a country. And so the logic of Roe, it's worked its way through our society at every level. And so we're going to need those who are firmly grounded in respect for the beauty and dignity of the human person to undo that damage everywhere. Mm-hmm. And that mean that and we're gonna what I love about your groups too, and I'm sure I was talking to someone, I said, I, I'm I said, what I love about Kristen Hawkins is the beautiful diversity that she allows to flower within SFLA. A word that's never been described, but I am flowering. It, no, it flowers. It's you yeah. there are these young people, I'll go speak at a campus, they pick me up and they're having they have all kinds of pins on. I'm like, wait, I think you picked up the wrong Jason Jones. You're looking for the Samantha B. Jason Jones, right? <laughs> And uh, they no, no, you. And I'm like, uh, 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 what it is, this? And it's across the spectrum. It is, yeah. And the pro, and, and so I say, that's fine. Mm-hmm. I, I, want, I don't want everyone to agree with me on everything. Um, yeah, I do. But they can't. That will never happen. So it's wonderful that we have, it seems like in this generation, a generation that is working its way to a respect for the human person mm-hmm. across the ideologies. Do you think that's possible? I mean, I, I know we're going off script, but we always go off script. So, yeah, it's like, my fault. you know, thinking about the end of abortion in our country, it with with the culture of death that we live in, we live in a post Christian society, really, in many regards. Do you think beyond accomplishing our goal of abolishing abortion, do you think it's actually possible for us to restore a a country, a culture that truly does respect the vulnerable. Not until we have full legal protection for the child and the woman from the violence of abortion. Roe versus Wade yeah. not only denied the founding principle of our country, which is what divided hearts of America is about our principle of unity, the declaration principle, mm-hmm. slavery, segregation, and then abortion denied what unites us, that principle of unity, the declaration principle. We're the only country in the history of the world founded on a vision, pers- a vision of the human person. The founding fathers were mistaken in once. They, they call it a self-evident truth. Hmm. It's really not a self-evident truth. That truth became, forgive me, it became evident with the incarnation of the second person of the Trinity into the world. So we live in a civilization, the West, what we call the West, that was birthed, that was birthed with this renewed understanding of the inviolable dignity of the human person when God became man. So... Can we have a society that is not Christian and then cling to the Christian vision of the human person? Sartre himself, the existentialist philosopher, said that human rights and human dignity was a Christian myth. Even liberalism and its errors um, is really still even grounded in the Christian vision of the human person. Yeah, I mean, that's why they want more government spending because they... They think that, oh, $15 minimum wage is going to help the It's person. grounded in a, they, a vision of human flourishing. They don't understand economics, but other than that. They don't understand unintended con- like yeah, I've, I, the law of unintended I consequences. opposed the invasion of Iraq, and people said, oh, you love dictators and hate the Iraqi people. No, I love Iraq very much, and I love the minority communities there very much. I know them very well. And so when I opposed the invasion of Iraq, it's because I saw how it was going to unfold. Mm. And sadly, it unfolded that way. I'm running shelters in Ukraine, and I've been arguing since the day the invasion began for negotiated peace. People mm-hmm. said, no, that they, Ukraine can win. You love Putin. I said, no, no, no. 
I just see how this is going to unfold. Mm. And I want to, I want to limit human suffering. Mm. Um, but yeah, so can we, I, so I'm a Catholic. I was an atheist, struggled to understand this, the nature of the human person and why do we have such respect for the human person. That led me to becoming a Christian, becoming a Catholic Christian. I wake up every morning and I know my mission statement is to love God and love my neighbor. And as you know, I aggressively share my faith, but not as aggressively as I used to with you. I, I thought that my apostolate, I, violence is the greatest scandal. It's the greatest stumbling block between a human being and God. There are a lot of horrible stumbling blocks that we can think of, but violence, I think, is the great scandal. And that's why when you meet society scarred by war, you think the rise of existentialism in the West after this hellish century that was the 20th century. Well, that's just natural. So I think, what can I do through my personal apostolate as a Christian who knows my mission statement? It's to um, stand between the vulnerable and the violent, to serve those who've suffered violence, try to reduce the scandal, or as we say in our organization, let's turn the stumbling block into a stepping stone. Hmm. Let's take this horrible situation to show people that God loves them, to show them what solidarity and sacrifice looks like. So to, I don't know how, if I'm answering your question, but promulgating the, our vision of the human person in society, of having an inviolable dignity, beauty, and worth, having a community, it's the first whole life principle, I have five principles, that if you advance this vision of the human person with inviolable dignity against transhumanism, against abortion, against racism, and all these other ideologies, subhumanist ideologies, when you advance the truth about the human person, I say I'm not an anti-abortion activist, I'm not a pro-life activist, I'm not a human rights activist, I'm an anthropologist. All I want to do is tell people the truth about the human person and treat the human person as the human person deserves to be respected. Mm -hmm. And um, when we do that, I think everything will order around that. Um, and that's why I think Students for Life of America is mm -hmm. the most important organization because as these students have the courage on campus to stand for the child in the womb when they're working at the State Department, they've been there for 17 years and they're looking at a catastrophe like the sudden um, ham-fisted withdrawal from a country that, whose regime and order we've toppled that will lead to chaos, oppression of women, violence, oppression of minorities, genocide. Um, they'll have the courage to push back. Mm. They'll have the fortitude to put together systems and processes and procedures to care for these communities mm. um, because it's all ordered around their understanding of who the human person is. That's beautiful. Thank you for explaining that. I think that's really helpful. Um, and I think that's so exciting to think about this entire, you know, now post road generation um, that's going to go out in the world and just transform it. They're, they're beautiful, loving, joyful. I went, um, it was the, the, the Mississippi decision we were waiting for, I believe. I don't, I don't know what decision it was. Mississippi was Dobbs. Was... Um, not Mississippi. It was Louisiana, maybe. Yeah. It was Louisiana. You had students out there. 20, I, I heard that. I don't know if you had them out there. They just did it on their own. I heard that there were students for life kids that were going to stay out all night. Yeah, who do you think paid for the pizza? Okay. I, the security I ate some of that pizza. Oh. So it's two in the morning. I do what I do, which is schmooze. Oh, that's right. You text me, where are you? And I was sleeping. <laughs> you were sleeping. But you know, my I job. Out before. My job, I try to explain this. She travels with me sometimes. She's like, why do you come home so tired? I'm like, you don't need to be out of bars till four in the morning. I'm like, no, that's my job. My job is to go to Washington, D.C. and ha hang out at bars till four in the morning. That's how I get my job done. So I had just come back to my hotel like at two in the morning. Someone said, I heard students for life kids are in front of the Supreme Court. So two in the morning, I take one of those, you know, those scooters you can like run your credit oh, card through. Oh, okay, that's how. So I'm going from DuPont Circle all the way to the Supreme Court. That's a long uh, yeah. scoot. It's an experience. <laughs> yeah. And I'm going through January. Yeah. I get there it was and December. these students, December, were just, it was a joyful, beautiful, mm -hmm. and I, I envied them. Because when I came to the, there was a national pro-life students organization in the 90s. And I was so excited to come to their conference. And I came to their conference and it was a Catholic university. It was about 60 students, mm -hmm. most of them from Catholic. And there was um, like one card table in the back with some brochures. That was what I experienced. I envy these young people today. Mm -hmm. But I look at them and I think they're going to change not only this country, but the world. Mm -hmm.
And, that, and I think that's what's so exciting and kind of my challenge to our generation has been, you know, seeing that reversal of Roe was not our legacy. It's what do we do now in this post row era and the, and really putting the final nails in the coffin of abortion in our country, of fulfilling that vision. And not only is that going to result in millions of lives saved here, but we know across the world they're watching what we do here right now. And that's why you've seen a lot of international news articles and TV you know, um, productions about the Dobbs decision and the reversal. So thanks, thanks for coming on today, Can I ask Jason. you one more question? Sure. Um, I have noticed that the mainstream media is covering your organization and the pro-life movement more fairly lately. Is this because they've recognized they haven't addressed the reality in America that they realized, oh no, we better address what's actually happening if we want any success. Mm -hmm. What's going on? Why are you guys getting what I believe is 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 some is of the best coverage? Or best coverage around. and honest and kind of fair. Yeah. No, it's not bad. Why is that? Um, they are genuinely shocked. So I would say that those in the mainstream media, we know how liberal they are. They, you know, they they're very pro-abortion. They are very shocked by. Uh, the row reversal. And I don't think they actually ever thought that would happen. And they're trying to figure out who is responsible. How did this happen? How did we miss it? There was a one of the best New York Times articles I've ever read. I loved it. It like profiled students for life and half of it. <laughs> and the woman, it was like learning from the terrible success of the anti-abortion movement. It was like but it was so great because the woman who wrote the article actually has read the same books that I have read, the sociology books about how do you create a movement? How do you make activists? And like, if the pro-abortion movement actually take her advice, I think it could be, it could harm us. They're not, it, it's, it's too late. But one of the things that they're like so shocked by is that in one of the articles was like, they're willing to have conversations. Kristen Hawkins relishes in having conversations with people who hate her. And like that's and be, because they truly don't. They shut down the conversation. They they'll refuse to go to the students for life. When I was a student, debate. the rule was not to debate us. Yeah, no, they still have that rule. I mean, only the really stupid ones come out to debate. You know, um, which is great for us, and we encourage them come out as much. Naive. We, yes, naive. The we naive want one. we want to plant those seeds, but th if they're in like the strategy, they know they're not supposed to do that as a student group, and so they just refuse. To, I mean. I was on CNN a couple of times, NPR, and the people you who, trounced that woman on CNN. Well, the people who hosted me, they there's articles attacking them for platforming me. How dare CNN give this anti-abortion activist eleven minutes? CNN should be ashamed of itself. And so, like that's their whole thing. They're not even attacking what I said. They're just attacking. but you were so sophisticated in your ability to handle the CNN reporter in a way that we as a movement had to learn. And I just think. We have been preparing for this day and they yeah. have not. They have not. And then, and, and I think the other thing is we tell them the truth. And so they'll ask, do you, you know, do you support, you know, a woman who's been raped? Do you support making sure, you know, taking away her right to abortion? And I'll say, well, I don't believe a human being who has been conceived in rape is, should be destined to die because of the sins of his or her father. And they're like, astounded because a lot of times pro-lifers will kind of jump around or You were the first the national pro-life leader, I think, and Father Frank, that courageously stood with children conceived in rape. And I believe that was the game changer because whenever we accepted those exceptions, we undermine all of our own talking points. Mm -hmm. We do. I mean, it's, it's like the pro-choice movement for years saying we want abortion to be safe, legal, and rare. They should have never said rare. Why would, it was a great political slogan for Bill Clinton to get people like my family to vote for him because mm -hmm. they said, oh, I don't like abortion, but not, not, not Bill Clinton. He says he wants it to be rare. Mm -hmm. We all know that was a lie. But that was a huge mistake on their movement because if abortion's so great, why should it be rare? And so they were for years saying something that, you know, reaffirmed in people's minds that there's something wrong with abortion, which you know, they don't say rare now. They say accessible. And they want people to shout their abortions. and yeah, No one's going to do that. Though, no right? one can do it because instinctively as a human being, no matter what you call yourself, you know something is tragic about that yeah. abortion decision. So, um, yeah, it's, 
uh, it's been really interesting, but I think it's we're willing to have the hard conversations. We're willing to say what we really believe to the press. We're not shutting them down. Uh, one of my friends, and many of you know her, uh, attacked this one journalist that I've been working with and having conversation with on Twitter. And she wrote this article that, you know, it kind of came across in the middle, but actually, if you read the undertones of the article, it's actually very, very pro-life. And yet pro-lifers were attacking this this journalist. And I was like, you know what? I actually thought you wrote a really fantastic pro-life article because you proved my point. And, and she was like, I know, did, no one else got that, you know? But so it, you have to build a relationship. But yeah, well, I mean- you've done it. Yeah, we're working on it. But yeah, you, you show them you show them who we are. We explain the mystery um, because to them, we're a big mystery. Like they don't, they don't get it. They don't get it. So I'm happy to illuminate the mainstream media. But thanks, Jason, for all you do. Thanks for you having rock. me. You rock. How do folks follow what you do at Movie the Movement, what you're doing at Vulnerable People Project, what you're doing with your podcast, the, the Jason, Jason Jones, Jones Show. You're coming on Look, soon. The Jason Jones oh, Show. We're doing... I, 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 I'm doing 49 days in a row, celebrating the end of row. Clever, right? Love it, love it. And uh, you're going to be one of those people. And um, so that's the Jason Jones Show. If you want to get involved with our work in Afghanistan, it's thegreatcampaign.org. That's our work in Afghanistan, Ukraine, advocating for vulnerable communities suffering ethnic cleansing and genocide. And of course, Movie to Movement. We have a new movie that we're in development on, Hills Like White Elephants. It's an Ernest Hemingway story where he really kind of confesses an abortion that he's responsible for. And we we're going to sh shoot it in Spain. It's going to be the quality of Crescendo. Mm -hmm. You know, when I make movies, I hope they're beautiful. They are. I want them to be startling. And as a young person, there were movies maybe that were kind of pro-life, but I felt that they didn't have the, the production budget, so they couldn't yes. have the quality. But we don't, we don't skimp on budget. If we're going to make a film, it's going to be a work of art. And this something you'd film. be proud to invite, you know, a pro-choice friend or family member to, to watch. To watch, like if you go to to movietomovement.com, you can see like crescendo, and I and we made it with Patty Millette, who happens to be the mother of that famous pro-life guy from Canada. What's his name? Justin Bieber. Justin Bieber. And is he really pro-life? He really is pro-life. Of course, so what, you know, his he wife was, isn't. She signed some like Planned Parenthood oh, up on her. But his fa her father is. Oh, interesting. Yeah, Stephen Baldwin. I didn't know that. Oh yeah, that's right. Okay, yeah. Yeah, he came to. Um, he flew all the way from Bulgaria to Iowa Straw Poll in two thousand seven to support Senator mm -hmm. Roundback. Yeah. Well, you know, young people have their ups and downs, and it's very challenging. It can be confusing, and that's why we're glad. But movie to movement dot com. Mm -hmm. You can see all our movies. And can folks, um, if you go to movement.com and if you run like a student's life group or a respect life group at your parish, can they get like the screening license to like yeah, legally screen Yeah, movie? you can legally I mean, screen. I'm saying there's ways to do it, but if you want the paperwork. Yeah, why are you winking at your people? Uh, I don't know. No, it, you know, like I tell people, once they call me, they go, how much is it? I'm like, well, now you got to do it. Now you got to do it. That's now what I'm saying. Now you got to do it. So. Just, just remember the activist rule is What's the actress role? Better to ask for forgiveness than permission. Oh, I didn't know. Yeah. I didn't know, bro. But uh, Crescendo and okay. Sing a Little Louder are free. Okay, cool. Yeah, so you just email us. Your campus wants you to get a form. Um, that's free. So email you at Movie to Movement? Movie to, yeah. You Jason, go to the, at, Jason at Movie to Movement.com okay. or go to the website. It's free. Um, Divide the Hearts of America is $199 for screening, which is like a really, really good deal. Mm -hmm. Usually over a thousand dollars, or you can go to Fox Nation and stream. Go to it. Fox Nation, or you buy the DVD and not tell me whatever you want. Okay, all right, cool. I'm not, I'm not saying to do that. Yeah, we're not saying that. I'm not saying anything like that. So um, we're good. But thank you for coming on. Thank it you was. For me. Thank you for uh, explaining whole life to me, and um, I'm very excited uh, for what we're going to be doing in, in the next couple of years as we transform this culture to create a radically whole life America. So Kristen Hawkins said it <sighs> sincerely. I did sincerely. sincerely. <laughs> right. uh, thank you all for tuning in today. I hope this discussion uh, between my good friend Jason and I, um, partner in crime sometime, uh, it was helpful for you and informative in some of the discussions you'll be having and are having now that we have entered a post-row era. Make sure you share this podcast uh, with your friends and family, even maybe even some of those on the fence, and make sure you check out movietomovement.com and greatcampaign.org uh, so you can follow Jason's work and uh, maybe you can tune into his podcast where he'll have me on. Who knows what will happen on that podcast? Thanks, guys.